I posted this video yesterday entitled Immolation and Hell, in which I discussed the self-immolation by Aaron Bushnell as a protest to the ongoing genocide in Palestine. After posting that, it was immediately slapped with a age restriction so that it would not be shown to anyone under 18. It was slapped with a warning so that you have to click through, oh, this video discusses suicidal topics, so you have to click here saying, I wish to proceed, discouraging people from watching it. Okay, that video is not promoting suicide. It is discussing the ongoing genocide and asking the question of why this active duty U.S. Air Force individual felt complicit in genocide. And I pointed out that the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, very strangely, more than 24 hours after the event, are still not talking about it. They don't have it anywhere on the front page of their newspapers when I posted that video. It's as if they had to get their stories together as to what they're going to talk about because this is a big event. This is world news and for it to be completely ignored for over 24 hours or left off of the front pages for over 24 hours is significant. And I suggest that it may have to do with the fact that this active duty Air Force, U.S. Air Force individual who self-immolated in protest stated he would no longer be complicit in genocide. The obvious question is, why did he feel complicit? What were his duties? What is going on? Okay? And obviously, they can't stay silent on it forever. So now they're starting to roll out their talking points. It's like they had to go to their master to find out what are we going to say about this one and they were scrambling because this is a very big event that got a lot of people's attention and the news media had to get their talking points so they could somehow obscure what this event is about and obscure the obvious questions of was this individual doing something that made him feel complicit? I asked those questions in that video, and here's what I got. I got, a, in addition to them slapping these suicide prevention warnings on my video, they also sent me a nice email this morning that says, the title of the email, Need Help? You're Not Alone, from YouTube No Reply. <laughs> Thanks, YouTube No Reply. Hi there chatty AI has decided to send me an email from our good friends at YouTube. Hi there, we're reaching out because members of the YouTube community, including fellow creators, viewers, or staff, have expressed concern for your safety or well-being after coming across content you posted with topics related to suicide or self-harm. We just came across some of your content like it's so it's like a, a little picnic well we were out for a picnic and we just came across your content we're not scouring keywords and <laughs> unleashing our ai on you no this comes from fellow creators viewers or staff who are expressing concern who who real human beings real real men and women real real individuals well let me just interrupt this chatty little email to let any real individuals know if any real fellow creators viewers or staff express concerns you don't need to be concerned for my safety and well-being after posting a video analyzing this very important world event by a US service member who self-immolated in protest of an ongoing genocide in Palestine Okay, I was an army officer for 11 years. Of course, I'm interested in this event. Everybody should be. And yes, as an infantry officer, as a company commander in 
active duty units of the United States Army. I was a company commander in the 4th Infantry Division. I was a platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne Division. These are frontline infantry units. Yes, I got training on suicide prevention and recognizing the signs of suicide. Yes, I learned about that. No, I don't have the signs, okay? Um, we're reaching out, they're reaching out. We, I don't know who these um, staff at YouTube community, I don't know who these people at the YouTube community are that are reaching out with their <laughs> no reply. Uh, but they sent me a link down below. If you or someone you know is experiencing suicide, look, this could just be an actual responsible program that they've put in to reach out when somebody puts up a video about anything to do with suicide. But it's obviously not a thinking person would not look at that video and think that. This is an AI, almost certainly an AI. But it's not uncommon to turn to suicidal thinking, they say, and self-harm as ways to cope with painful emotions. Okay, I discussed that in the video. I've written a book about connections between the ancient myths and cutting-edge psychology. I'm not a psychologist. I don't claim to be a psychologist at the front of that book. I say I'm not a psychologist. If you have mental health issues or you're feeling depressed, anxious, or anything else, Go see a mental health professional. I say that at the beginning of my book, okay? But I'm talking about the ancient myths in that book and how the ancient myths line up with the discoveries of cutting edge healers like Dr. Richard Schwartz. We'll talk about that a little bit, but back to this nice um, concerned email from no reply at YouTube. It's not uncommon. Talking to someone can help you process these emotions as well as get support through a difficult time. We encourage you to use the resources listed in our help center if you need support. These include organizations specific to your location. Look, this could be good for somebody to get this maybe. I don't know. I, I take it as a threat actually. I don't like YouTube. I don't like Google. Right? It's a CIA funded organization. I don't believe they are concerned with my well-being. And I take it as threatening when someone says, we are expressing concern for your safety. Okay? That's, that can be interpreted as a threat. I don't like that. But they do put in bold letters there at the conclusion. We care about you. You are not alone and help is available. Please take care. Take very good care. All right. The YouTube team. Thank you, YouTube team. Thank you, YouTube community, for your concern. Let me put your mind at ease. I am not at all contemplating any violence against any person, including myself. This is a statement that I put at the end of my 2014 book, The Undying Stars. This is the first book showing that the Bible is based on the stars. I put this at the end under about the author. I put David Warner Matheson asserts his natural law right as a man to speak the truth in peace without being threatened with violence, incarceration, or assassination. He is not contemplating any violence against any person, including himself, nor does he condone violence in any way. Okay, why did I put that in this book? Because. Anyway, I, this is as clear a statement as you need. I'm not contemplating any violence against anybody, including myself, least of all myself, least of all myself. Now, in my book, Invoking the Ancient Gods in You, I explain that there are different parts inside of us, and those parts can take on roles that seem self-destructive, but they're actually doing it because they are trying to hold the system together and they're trying to, they are stuck 
in places due to things that may have happened in childhood or during some kind of trauma or extreme situation. They're stuck and they're exhibiting behaviors that come from that place in the past that they're still trying to cover up. In that video, I got this email sent to me from YouTube. I explained that in IFS, these protector parts, these firefighter parts, sometimes they'll become so extreme that some of them will take on suicidal patterns, okay? Now, this is a quotation from an IFS using doctor, Dr. Lawrence T. Wentworth, who says right here, a practicing psychologist for over 35 years, and he explains how internal family systems is an evidence-based psychotherapy model developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz that works very well when it comes to suicide prevention. This model posits that we are all a multiplicity of parts and that at our core we have a self that is made up of wonderful qualities like compassion, curiosity, courage, calm, and connectedness, for example. When we are hurt or traumatized in life, those parts of us are put away or exiled from our awareness and protective parts of our systems take over. Suicidal parts are the ultimate protectors. The IFS model does not demonize or pathologize these parts, but instead works to get to know them and see the noble intention they have for us. Parts, like people, long to be seen, heard, and understood. Some people worry that welcoming and befriending our suicidal protectors would, be just, would just be encouraging them to follow through on their plans. Actually, it's just the opposite. One of my clients told me that no one ever wanted to hear from her suicidal part, and one of the reasons she is still here is that her suicidal part feels welcomed and safe to vent these feelings. So if someone has a part that is acting in those very extreme ways and expressing suicidal thoughts, you can't get rid of a part, but you can help it to take on a different role. You can unburden it. And I talk about that in this book, how the myths dramatize this. The ancient myths actually dramatize this. This is a cutting edge discovery by a modern practitioner, Dr. Richard Schwartz, that is being used very successfully by actual psychologists around the world. It is based on thousands of hours of evidence-based psychotherapy with tens of thousands of clients, okay? And the ancient myths actually dramatize this. I show that in my book, okay? And so this doctor says we can work with those suicidal protectors and we can give them other roles. We can help them go on to other roles within the system. We can never get rid of any parts. If we try, that only makes it worse. But we can find out what is going on, help the exile that they're protecting and unburden those parts and help those protectors, those firefighters in this case, to move on to a different role, to be a strong defender in a more positive and welcome way rather than in an unwelcome and negative way. Okay, so that's what I was talking about. I talked about it in that video that got YouTube or their AI to send me an email. This is very real. This is very serious. I urge people to go to mental health professionals in my book. I don't pretend to be a mental health professional and I point people towards the mental health professionals, but I am an expert on the ancient myths and what they show, and what they show is exactly this. Now, the major media outlets have had a couple days to try and somehow spin this story away from a condemnation of the genocide, the ongoing genocide and ethnic cleansing that the U.S. is perpetrating through Israel 
The U.S. is absolutely enabling Israel, as I said in videos long before this self-immolation took place this past weekend. The, it's quite clear Israel could not do this without the enabling and resupply and military assistance of the United States, including intelligence and targeting. That's why I asked the question in my video, was Aaron Bushnell somehow involved in that? This is a very damaging incident. That's probably why there was this very strange silence while they spun around trying to figure it out. You would think they would start reporting on it and saying, okay, we're digging into this, we're digging into this. But no, they were silent and now they're starting to roll out their angle on it. And here we have a reliable spokesman for the U.S. Empire showing us some of the ways that they're going to try and spin this. And a lot of it has to do with, predictably enough, oh, mental health, suicide. Let's not talk about it. So here we have from the Washington Post, Ramesh Panuru, self-immolation is not an act of political protest we should celebrate by Ramesh Panuru, February 28, 2024 at 6.23 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, this happened on the 25th. On the 26th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Wall Street Journal and New York Times still didn't even have anything about it on their front page of either of those two landing pages, nor in the print edition that morning. It was not on the front page as I showed in my video, but February 28th, so that's basically today. I'm filming this on in Australia, it's already the 29th, but basically happened on the 25th, silence, desperate scrambling, how are we gonna spin this? And here, now we're going to start spinning it. Here's Ramesh Panuru to spin it for us. Self-immolation is not an act of political protest we should celebrate. And he says, a major goal of any protest is simply to say, we care about this cause and you should too. Hence the attraction of extreme forms of protest. When someone dies to make a point, as Aaron Bushnell, a young airman who set himself on fire outside the Israeli embassy in D.C. did this week, no one can maintain that he was posturing or virtue signaling. Thanks, Ramesh Panuru. You're right, no one can. When he wrote about U.S. complicity in genocide against the Palestinian people, he meant it. That level of commitment has earned Bushnell some posthumous praise. Activist Aya Hijazi called him, quote, a hero and a martyr, and his suicide, quote, a wake-up call. Jewish Voice for Peace honored his, quote, final act of solidarity. Cornell West, a progressive academic who is running for president, said we should never forget Bushnell's courage. Green Party candidate Jill Stein quoted Bushnell and added, quote, this extraordinary sacrifice brings into greater focus the immense horror that our government is committing in our name, end quote. And now Ramesh Panuru, these econiums are irresponsible. They are also false. Bushnell's suicide didn't teach us anything. It didn't and won't save one life. NPR quoted a sociologist who said that it drew attention to the Palestinian cause. Quote, the very fact that we are talking about this shows that it breaks through, end quote. But we have been talking about the conflict in the Middle East for months, Panuru says. All that has changed is that some attention has been diverted to Bushnell's story. His death will not change U.S. public or poli will not change U.S. policy or public opinion, and it shouldn't. And then he gives some excuses to try and say that it's not a genocide that's going on. Many people who support Israel's campaign, Israel's campaign do so even though they consider the deaths of innocent Palestinians a tragedy, albeit one they mostly blame on Hamas. Whether they're right or wrong in that judgment, nothing Bushnell did should change it. The convictions that motivated Bushnell were, as it happens, noxious. We don't have any proof that the convictions that motivated him were noxious. He denied that any Israeli could be a civilian. No, he said, I will no longer be complicit in genocide. That's what drove him, Ramesh Panuru. 
That's what you can prove basically from his video. Yeah, he posted things saying that Israel is an apartheid state in a settler colonialist state. He did say those things, okay? But what he said before he self-immolated was, I will no longer be complicit in genocide, in genocide. All right, he didn't say I'm going to kill Israelis because they are uh, not civilians. He didn't say that, and he didn't do that. Do that. So Ramesh Panuru is taking the attention all over the place. I'm not defending Aaron Bushnell as a person. I don't know Aaron Bushnell. We'll see in a moment some quotations from someone who did, but. I don't know Aaron Bushnell, and if he had noxious opinions, that doesn't change the fact that what he did was proclaim that he did not want to be complicit in genocide as an active duty U.S. Air Force airman, and then he lit himself on fire in protest of that ongoing genocide. That's what we know, and that's what motivated him clearly, and Ramesh Panuru like everyone else, doesn't ask the question, why did he feel complicit in the genocide as an active duty Air Force airman? He doesn't want anyone to ask that question, so he's going to roll all over, he's going to take your attention all over the place other than that. Defenses of Bushnell's suicide, now he's going to spend the rest of the time talking about how defending Bushnell's suicide are especially wrong-headed now because we have a suicide epidemic. Well, if we do, it's because of economic policies like the ones that Ramesh Panuru has championed consistently for years, neoliberalism and American imperialism and extreme hyper-financialized capitalism, all of which Ramesh Panuru has never found it in his heart to criticize. In fact, he champions them. But he's going to now start to say, oh, we can't talk about this suicide, and we certainly can't praise Bushnell because we have an epidemic of suicide. Well, we do, and that's a problem, and I care about it very much. I don't know if Panuru does or not, but let's read the rest of his article, and then we'll, we'll see if, whether, whether you think he's sincere about this or not. It is an epidemic, and it is horrible, but that has nothing to do with the situation at hand of a U.S. Air Force airman saying he doesn't want to be complicit in genocide anymore. And we can't, we can't say, you know what, I agree, we shouldn't, like Jill Stein said, this extraordinary sacrifice brings into greater focus the immense horror that our government is committing in our name. Is our government committing horror in our name? Well, according to Ramesh Panuru, that's irresponsible to even say that and it's also false. He's, he's, he's telling you that. And now he's going to say, defenses of Bushnell's suicide are especially wrong-headed now. Our country has seen rising rates of mental illness among young people. Yeah. They're so in debt, they can't buy a house. And asset price inflation is, has elevated the house prices so much that homelessness is an, is an outright, outright epidemic. I grew up in the United States. I've seen the change. It's off the charts. And yes, rising rates of mental illness is a real problem. That's what healers like Dr. Gabor Mate and Dr. Richard Schwartz talk about. And they're related to economic policies, absolutely directly related to economic policies. And I talk about it too. And the ancient myths talk about it. Okay. Our country has seen rising rates of mental illness among young people including rising rates of self-harm, which suggests this isn't just a matter of more diagnoses. No, you're right about that. It's an economic, it's a matter of economics, Ramesh Panuru, and your economic policies are poisonous. Suicide rates have been rising for decades. Some commentators insist that there is no evidence Bushnell suffered from any form of mental illness, even though, okay, even though a police report indicated signs of mental distress before the fatal act. Okay, so the police report said there was mental distress, so therefore we can't claim that he wasn't mentally ill. The police report, the police engagement with Bushnell um, during the fatal act does not suggest that they were 
analyzing whether or not he is mentally ill or not. All right, this is just this is just completely disingenuous by Ramesh Panuru. Well, we'll point to the police report to counteract commentators who say there's no evidence that Bushnell suffer, suffered from mental illness. All right, that's that's a red herring. Whether he suffered from mental illness or not, he stated quite clearly and logically, I will no longer be complicit in genocide. Was he, was he insane? Was he mentally ill? Ramesh Panuru? Well, the police report said he was showing signs of mental distress. Yeah, he lit himself on fire. I would say he was mentally distressed over being complicit in U.S. genocide, apparently, Ramesh Panuru. But even if we were to assume his behavior was in some sense, was in some sense well considered and rational, we have to reckon with the possible consequences of his decision and the attendant publicity and praise for him for people with suicidal thoughts. Okay, we can't give any publicity or praise to Aaron Bushnell declaring he doesn't want to be complicit in genocide. Why not? Because of people with suicidal thoughts. Studies have long recognized the phenomenon of suicide contagion. It's also plausible, and we have some evidence, that there is a connection between mental illness and some types of political extremism, such as sympathy for political violence. Okay, Aaron Bushnell didn't show any signs of political violence, at least in the video that I saw. Um, but anyway, Ramesh Panuru is just throwing in red herring after red herring. That has nothing to do with the issue at hand of, as Jill Stein said, the immense horror that our government is committing in our name that Aaron Bushnell is bringing attention to and saying he doesn't want to be complicit in anymore. This is exactly the wrong cultural moment to portray suicide as righteous and productive. Who's portraying suicide as righteous and productive? Ramesh Panuru. We'll find out in a minute. We should mourn for Bushnell and anyone who loved him, Ramesh says, but we should not imbue his suicide with a grandeur it does not deserve. He accomplished nothing good by killing himself. No matter how passionate your beliefs, please don't follow the example of his senseless death. Please don't follow. This is absolutely illogical way to try and spin this away from what the real questions are. But remember, Ramesh Panuru doesn't want to imbue his suicide with a grandeur it does not deserve, accomplish nothing good, and this is absolutely the wrong moment, the wrong cultural moment to portray suicide as righteous and productive. Hmm. Let's go to the so-called Arab Spring. And we have an article here by someone named, oh, Ramesh Panuru, an editor of National Review. You can see up top, this appeared in National Review. Economic Freedom and Human Dignity in the Middle East, February 8th, 2011. National Review is a right-wing website. It was originally a magazine started by William F. Buckley, affiliated with the CIA, extremely right-wing. It's a right-wing platform, and Ramesh Panuru in 2011 is championing economic freedom and human dignity in the Middle East, economic freedom to go into your country and write bonds and indebt you like they did to Greece and many other countries. And it means economic freedom for Western corporations to go in and pull the minerals out of your ground without being taxed. and pull the oil out of the ground without any of that wealth benefiting the population of the nation. That's what economic freedom really means, especially in the Middle East. But anyway, the quote Arab Spring, well, that meets with National Review's American Empire agenda, or let's call it hyper-capitalist oligarchical agenda. And so therefore, Ramesh Panuru is all for the Arab Spring. Let's read about what he said in 2011. Hernando de Soto, I'm quite familiar with Hernando de Soto. He's a South American economist, and I've read his stuff. I've owned his books. I've 
in the past agreed with him when I when I had a different economic and political philosophy than I do today. But anyway, we won't get too into Hernando de Soto. But Hernando de Soto explains the connection between the denial of property rights, economic stagnation, and political unrest in Egypt. And there's a link if you want to read the article by de Soto. To my mind, he missed an opportunity to use a great illustration of the point. Oh, Hernando de Soto, great economic mind that Ramesh Panuru agrees with, he wrote an article about what's going on in Egypt, the unrest, the Arab Spring, but he missed a great opportunity to use an illustration of the point. What illustration is that, Ramesh Panuru? Inquiring minds want to know. Well, Ramesh is going to quote extensively from Pete Wainer. Pete Wainer writes, well, here's the, here's the example that Hernando de Soto should have used. Here's what Pete Wainer writes. It is amazing that the political revolution now sweeping across the Middle East and North Africa was started by a 26-year-old unemployed Tunisian man who self-immolated. What? That's the great illustration? Hernando de Soto missed it. He should have been trumpeting this great illustration a 26-year-old self-immolating. The irony, or the, the dark irony, I almost wonder if this is planned. Like, did they pick Ramesh Panuru to write this spin article for the Washington Post about a 25-year-old who self-immolated over the weekend and why we shouldn't be talking about it as an example of anything? Don't imbue it with grandeur. But in 2011, a 26-year-old man who self-immolated is a great illustration of Hernando de Soto's economic arguments? Am I, am I living in a, <laughs> a simulation? What is going on here? Ramesh Panuru. Let's let him continue. So he's, he's going to quote extensively. On December 17, 2010, Mohamed Bouazizi, Bouazizi Mohamed Bouazizi, a university graduate whose fruits and vegetables market stand was confiscated by police because it had no permit, tried to yank back his apples. He was slapped in the face by a female municipal inspector and eventually beaten by her colleagues. His later appeals were ignored. Humiliated, he drenched himself in paint thinner and set himself on fire. He died on January 4. So, he self-immolated on December 17. He died on January 4. It was a very painful way to die. He was burned. Okay, when I was in the 82nd Airborne, an Air Force fighter jet crashed into a, uh, there were two Air Force aircraft that crashed in midair right above Green Ramp where a whole battalion of paratroopers in a sister battalion were sitting with all their parachutes and military gear on waiting to get on the aircraft and they were engulfed in a fireball flames and uh, burned to death many many of them burned to death uh, i i heard the first-hand stories we were called into the battalion headquarters and and we um, were told what was going on and we and some of us were going to have to go talk to widows and explain that they're husbands had died okay and I went to the burn units and visited some of those soldiers and I can tell you it was horrific and uh, they later died and I can remember exactly what they looked like and exactly what those burns did to their bodies and I won't describe it okay and I won't describe some of the stories that I heard of people who were trying to um, douse the flames and save other soldiers on green ramp that night okay but it is horrific. So Ramesh Panuru says this is a great example he missed. Um, but uh, December 17th, self-immolated, died on January 4th after a long struggle for life. But he probably wasn't going to make it with those kinds of burns. And the same thing with Aaron Bushnell. He, he was taken to the hospital, but he didn't survive. That incident was the spark that set ablaze. Okay. That incident was the spark 
that set ablaze the revolution that overthrew that overthrew President Zine El Abedini Ben Ali, who ruled Tunisia for more than two decades. Ramesh Panuru sounds all for the Arab Spring, shaking up the Middle East and giving more access to Western economic freedom. Okay, so in this case, that self-immolation can be called the spark that set ablaze the revolution that's spreading through the Middle East. Again, he's quoting someone else, but he's quoting him approvingly here. That incident was the spark that set ablaze the revolution, imbuing it with some grandeur, I might add, that overthrew President Ben Ali of Tunisia for more than two decades, and that in turn spread to Egypt, where Hosni Mubarak's 30-year reign of power is about to end. Anti-government protests are also happening in Jordan, Morocco, Yemen, and elsewhere. It's hard to tell where all this will end, but how it began may rank among the more extraordinary hinge moments in history. It may come to be known as the slap heard round the world. Ramesh Panuru quotes that approvingly. And the shot around the world was the start of the revolution. The slap that caused this man, he got beaten by the police and he was humiliated by that and self-immolated in protest about that. And because that was somehow about entrepreneurial things that right-wing leaning National Review approves of, and they also approve of the Arab Spring, well, that's, that's good. But a self-immolation that calls attention to a U.S.-enabled genocide, ongoing genocide by U.S. ally Israel, don't talk about it. It might encourage suicide. Like, the cynicism is, is just ridiculous. So judge for yourself if Ramesh Panuru is sincere in his concerns that talking about Aaron Bushnell might be too much for the rising levels of mental stress and suicidal tendencies in young people. I'm not denying that that is a big problem, but that's a big problem because of actual economic policies. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And don't tell me that Ramesh Panuru is sincere if he wrote this. Unless, if he's sincere and has had a massive change of heart since writing this, he better explain that somewhere. I would think in the article that he just wrote, you know, back in 2011, I mistakenly quoted approvingly somebody who said, oh, this, this spark that Mohammed Bouazizi lit could light the whole Middle East on fire. I'm really sorry that I did that, Ramesh Panuru. Where's, where's that in that article? Nowhere, because he's not sincere. He's trying to figure out how to spin this situation of an American serviceman saying, I don't want to be complicit in genocide. Nobody's asking the obvious question. Why, what, complicit in genocide um, someone from the Air Force want to explain why he said that, what he was doing, what does he know? No, we got to suppress that. We got to take your eyes off of that question. It's a very obvious question. But Ramesh Panuru can't think to ask that question. He wants to take your eyes off of it. That, this is a spin to take your eyes off of it. Now, here is some apparently real journalism taking place. New York Post is a bit of a. Um, right-wing <laughs> publication as well but look at this hmm. three three authors Jack Morfitt Andy Tillett and Kate Sheehy have apparently maybe they were contacted by a friend of Aaron Bushnell I don't know but they've done some journalism here U.S. Airman Aaron Bushnell claimed to have classified knowledge of U.S. forces fighting in Gaza tunnels on night before setting himself on fire. Pal. 
Aaron Bushnell claimed he had secret knowledge of U.S. troops fighting in Hamas tunnels under Gaza just hours before setting himself on fire in an extreme act of protest against Israel, a close pal told The Post Tuesday. That is a very big story, okay? I don't know who this close pal is, but I would be concerned for his safety. In fact, I would almost argue that that close pal should go public and make his face and name widely known to prevent anything from happening to him. That's what I would say. This is a very big story, and so I commend the New York Post, kudos to these three journalists for publishing this story because this is exactly what those other stories are trying to keep you from seeing. You can read the whole article for yourself. There's no paywall, there's no paywall on it. I won't read the whole thing. It's disturbing. His actual job involves the processing of intelligence data, this friend said. One of the things he told me is that coming across his desk was the U.S. military was involved in the genocides going on in Palestine, the friend said, referring to Israel's war against the Palestinian terror group Hamas in Gaza. Okay, New York Post has to spin it that this is a war against the Palestinian terror group Hamas. That's not what it looks like. It looks like it's an ongoing genocide and ethnic cleansing. That's what it looks like to me. That's what it looks like to the world when you're shooting journalists who are trying to cover what's going on when you're doing controlled demolition on all the universities in Gaza, when you're intentionally starving the population and inducing a famine there, and you've got, and, and you've got politicians stating that that's their stated purpose, that's their stated goal, and that they want to drive all the Palestinians all the way out all the Palestinians all the way out and put them in another, find other countries for them to live in. That's called ethnic cleansing. And that is a genocide according to the United Nations and the Geneva Convention and the laws and policies and papers that were written after World War II, trying to define what a genocide is. So the New York Post has to spin it as Israel's war against the Palestinian terror group Hamas in Gaza. It's not a war, it's Israel absolutely obliterating a population that they're responsible for, actually. It's within their own borders. He told me that we had troops on the ground, you know, that were there and were killing large numbers of Palestinians. There's just too many things I don't know. This is a quote from the friend. Quote, he told me that we had troops on the ground, you know. He, Aaron Bushnell, told me, the friend. This is a quote from the friend. Quote, he told me that we had troops on the ground, you know, that, there, that were there that were there, and were killing large numbers of Palestinians. There's just too many things I don't know. But I can tell you that the tone of his voice just had something in it that told me he was scared, end quote, the buddy said. Quote, I've never heard that tone come out of him. Aaron Bushnell was scared, the buddy said. I'd never heard that tone come out of him. Because this is information that the American people do not have. Although Bushnell claimed he was imparting top secret information to his pal, there's no way of verifying whether it is true. But the Washington Post states that they have verified that this friend is legitimate and knew Aaron Bushnell, okay? So, is that something that's going on without the American people knowing about it? And you've got the media falling all over themselves to avoid asking that question, apparently, other than this story in the New York Post. Whoa. That's a big deal. Now, the United States just celebrated President's Day. 
Washington's birthday, February 22nd. I made a video. President's Day was observed on February 19th this year. In George Washington's farewell address, he said, observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Good faith and justice toward all nations. Just ask yourself if the United States is doing this today. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. A passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake. He's talking primarily about the imperialist powers of Europe and all their infighting and conniving and cloak and dagger and their insidious wiles. He's saying, watch out for them. We're, we've escaped that. We've broken away from that. The British Empire, chief among them. We've broken away from that. Watch out for them. Don't get attached to them. Israel is a creation of the British Empire. Zionism was a British project starting in the 1800s. Okay, It's a very cynical British project starting in the 1800s. It's a British Empire project. Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake. And watch out for a passionate attachment to one, any one nation out there. This is George Washington speaking. It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world. And Thomas Jefferson, when he became president, he said, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. So ask yourself, is that, is that still the policy that's being pursued by the United States or not. But I'll just reiterate at the end of this video, no YouTube, no Google. I am absolutely not contemplating any violence against anyone, least of all myself. And I don't like that insinuation that anyone who looks at this event in a critical way and talks about it must be uh, dangerously suicidal. No, that's a lie. That's a canard. That's a distraction from these very real and important issues that the American people, and in fact the world, should be looking at and asking questions about. And I especially condemn the spin that Ramesh Panuru and that the subservient media which is the enablers of America's criminal foreign policy that's going on. The, the, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution says that we need a free press, a free press to be able to ask questions. Obviously, the mainstream media is controlled. They took a couple of days to try and figure out how to spin this one and now they're starting to spin it and I resent the way that I I condemn the way that they're spinning it as let's not talk about this we've got a whole lot of mental health and uh, we shouldn't imbue this with any kind of grandeur we shouldn't um, think that this gives any additional weight to the message that the US is enabling a genocide and not stopping a genocide look when I was in the 82nd Airborne, we had something called the Multinational Force and Observers, where we sent battalions over to the Sinai. What was it there for? It was there to, pre pre to prevent further wars in the Middle East. It was, it was put there after the conflicts in the Sinai, in these, all these wars that Israel was conducting with neighbors all around them, or that their neighbors were conducting against Israel, whichever way you want to spin it. But they put a multinational force there to stop this kind of violence. But for the past months, 
no multinational force has moved in to stop this genocide that's going on. That's what you would think would take place. Hey, let's get a United Nations force in there to stop this killing. Isn't that what we wish had happened in Rwanda? Apparently not. Isn't that what we would think would happen when the International Court of Justice says, hey, what Israel is doing is wrong. Wouldn't you think that the United Nations would then say, well, do we have a multinational force and observers that we can send in to stop it and, and stop the violence until we can sort this out? Nope. So it's being enabled. It's being enabled. And so Ramesh Panuru is saying, don't imbue this message with any additional weight because of the fact that this young man self-immolated. Anyone who says so, it's, it's noxious for them to say so. Whereas Ramesh Panuru in 2011 was in saying, oh, this is like the slap heard around the world. This is like as, this is as, this is as revolutionary as the American Revolution against the British Empire. It's disgusting, disgusting. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson would be disgusted. Let me just conclude by saying, I certainly do not condone suicide. I certainly do not approve of suicide. I certainly do not encourage suicide. And I certainly do not think about suicide myself. Those who do have mental health issues or anxiety or depression or suicidal thoughts, absolutely, I encourage you to see a mental health professional. I would especially encourage one who knows about trauma and knows about the work of Dr. Gobbler Mate, and knows about the work of Dr. Richard Schwartz, and maybe one who practices internal family systems therapy. Because, like the quotations that I showed, a practicing psychologist for 35 years says, IFS is extremely helpful for dealing with suicidal problems, suicidal thoughts, suicidal parts who want to be heard. These are really important. These are really important issues. I will speak out about them. I don't like YouTube sending me emails and slapping warnings on my videos when I do talk about them. They're absolutely pertinent to my work. My work is pertinent to this subject. And I believe that the ancient myths are a tremendous resource to help us in all aspects of our life, both on the individual level and on the wider societal level. Thank you so much for watching. And the shower around the world was the start of the revolution. The men and men were ready on the move. Take your powder, take your gun, report to General Washington. Hurry men, there's not an hour to lose. Now at famous Bunker Hill,